work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Before we can talk about how anthropology disproves Noah's flood, I'm going to have to explain a few things about human evolution that you likely wouldn't know unless this is a subject that you're passionate about. The various species of humans within the genus Homo evidently evolved from Australopiths. Our closest known ancestral archetype is Australopithecus afarensis, also known as Lucy. Although she was just the first of hundreds of her species to be discovered. So when I say Lucy, I'm referring to the whole species and not any one individual. The media did the same thing with Artipithecus. Artie was older than Lucy, so headlines proclaimed that Lucy wasn't our ancestor anymore because Journalists don't understand paleoanthropology, and sensationalism is what sells the deuce. So let me set this straight. Lucy is roughly 3.2 million years old. Artie is more than a million years older than Lucy, and this new one from Greece is millions of years older than Artie. Artie's descendants may have led to multiple branches, only one of which include Lucy. Lucy's lineage led to multiple branches, only one of which include humans. The survey said... <laughs> Aran Ra looks to the fossil record, but the fossil record is no help to Aran Ra. The further we go back in the fossil record, we actually run into what is called the Cambrian explosion, where we have all this phyla suddenly appear out of nowhere. We have jellyfish, coral, trilobites, these greatly different organisms, these different body types, all highly complex structures, and yet no evidence for this assumed evolution. This is the opposite of what Darwin expected. If we have a phylum level event, there must have been astronomical numbers of evolutionary experiments in order to evolve such amazing complexity and features. The evidence isn't there, Arn Ra. The evidence does not support universal common ancestry. The fossil record does not help Arn Ra. Genetics does not help Arn Ra. Genetics confirms separate ancestry. We see boundaries. We see boundaries in both the fossil record and genetics. This is all confirmation of independent origins. As a matter of fact, if we were to just focus in on humans in the fossil record, we see no evidence of hundreds of thousands of years of human existence. Sorry, Aaron Ra. Given the evolutionary model that Aaron Ra holds to, we can assume there were about a million Homo erectus living across Eurasia, Africa, and essentially handling a massive distribution. Now, let us say their average generation time is 20 years. That means about every 20 years, you have another million dead bodies. And so after a million years, we have over 20 billion dead people. This is 20 billion people of which we have no evidence ever existed. Even the proponents of evolution like Aaron Ra would agree that Erectus had primitive technology. There would have been campsites, villages, and fire. There would have been a ton of evidence for their existence, and yet we do not see that evidence. What we do see, though, is an abrupt appearance with unique differences in humans. Erectus has very human-like qualities and unique differences not seen in prior hominins. And this is from its first appearance. Humans have always been humans in the fossil record with no gradual transition from more ape-like creatures to humans. As a matter of fact, years ago, Mary Leakey discovered footprints that are indistinguishable from modern human footprints. As a matter of fact, if these footprints were discovered today, nobody, not even Aaron Ra, would question these footprints. They would all conclude that they were made by barefooted human beings. Evolutionists have dated these footprints to roughly three or four million years ago. And therefore, because of their circular reasoning, they cannot conclude these were made by humans. Aaron Ra looks to Australopithecus afarensis. Well, Lucy herself was found in hundreds of pieces over a large area. Isn't it hilarious that the genetic data does not fit Aaron Ra's model? And so he wants to look to low quality, low confidence scientific data. 
when they say they have hundreds of specimens of Lucy species, what they actually mean is 400 pieces of bones. Many of these bones even turn out to be teeth. What we find in terms of paleoanthropology is deliberate exaggeration. Even Lee Berger, a famous paleoanthropologist, has pointed out that there are more people working in the field than there are actual objects to study. He points out most of the record pertaining to human origins is bone fragments, bits and pieces of postcranial bones and teeth, lots of teeth. You'll oftentimes see these skulls propped up as, say, Lucy's skull, when in fact, most of what you have is a few skull fragments, with most of the reconstructed skull being inference-based. There are massive differences that exist in terms of genetics that refutes the idea that humans and chimpanzees are related. Some of the amazing differences include human-specific genes, multifunctional and multipurpose genes, differential gene expression, unique transcription factors, non-coding DNA and its many amazing functions not predicted by evolutionists. The FOXP2 gene, signs and lines, long non-coding RNAs, genomic networks, and more. R and Ra might scoff at the existence of deleterious mutation accumulation. He may attempt to say and reject the scientific data by making the claim that there is no evidence. Well, it turns out that Dr. John Sanford and colleagues have developed a massive computer program, Mendel's Accountant. It is actually the most sophisticated evolutionary modeling system ever written. You can literally take any mutation rate you want, any mutation distribution, population size, all these parameters you can apply you can apply these artificial populations. We then allow it to run its course. We look to natural selection and we find over and over and over again that any realistic set of parameters, evolution does not work. Genetic degeneration is inevitable and r and Ra has no answer. The rescue devices he could look to, truncation selection, mutation count mechanism, synergistic epistasis, super beneficial mutations, trade-offs, you name it. They have all been looked at, analyzed, and published, and they all fail. They all fail miserably. They've been falsified. What we observe in the fossil record is death, degeneration, and extinction. And this is all consistent with the Genesis starting point. Now, there are a couple different things going on that give the evolutionary community the impression that human evolution is true. One is that there are often artificial species that consist of a mixture of ape and human beings. The sites paleoanthropologists would go to for their next big missing link are often scattered with fragmented bones. Consequently, bones of multiple species would be confused as one single species when in fact they were separate species, humans and apes. The bones are being found together at these excavation sites, intermingled. For example, Australopithecus sediba and Homo habilis could be artificial constructs that consist of a loose collection of human and ape bones. Ella Bin and Yoel Rack hold this view of Australopithecus sediba based on the lumbar vertebra and jaw bones that are derived from two different genera. Also, Australopithecus afarensis is claimed by experts to be a chimeric species. It is a jumble of bones from multiple species. Even Donald Johansson has reported at one time that at least two different species from two different genera were represented in his bones. Some fossils even looking exactly like human fossils. Many of the hominin fossils are clear evidence of rapid genomic degeneration. Yet proponents of human evolution point to them as evidence for ape-to-man evolution. 
This rapid genomic degeneration is due to inbreeding, isolation, and founder effects. Many of these hominin fossils clearly display anomalous pathologies. This would reveal that in the past, several isolated and inbred human populations have experienced what is called reductive evolution. This is essentially devolution. Well, what has this type of reductive evolution resulted in? The answer to this question is genetic pathologies. These numerous genetic pathologies would be reduced body size and reduced brain size. Genetic degeneration is very real and cannot be denied. We see it today and we also see it in the past. We see it in the fossil record. Homo naledi, a frequently pointed to example of human evolution is simply more evidence of reductive evolution. This is what we see. Naledi was clearly inbred and suffered from genetic degeneration, again resulting in reduced body size, reduced brain volume, and various pathologies. The same thing is observed in Erectus. Although less advanced, the reductive evolution is clearly present. And so, several of the bones of the purported Homo species like the hobbits, Homo erectus, Homo naledi, and Homo neanderthalensis appear to demonstrate testimony of serious inbreeding and genetic degeneration. This would be, of course, due to post-Babel dispersion of people groups. Many of the people groups would have migrated to parts of the earth that were less than ideal. If a people group, for example, became isolated and inbreeding resulted as a consequent, rapid genetic degeneration would occur. Harsh environmental conditions in the immediate post-flood world would also lead to disease nutrition deficiencies, and environmental-related genetic degeneration. There were many negative factors at play in the immediate post-flood and post-Babel world that would lead to accelerated genetic decay of small people groups. This means that many of the troubling human fossils that evolutionary proponents say are pre-human are better realized to be devolution. We oftentimes see morphological and genetic degeneration. We are told by the evolutionists that these fossils are evidence for ape to man evolution when in fact this is just more evidence of genetic entropy. Genetic entropy is a reality and the critics deny this reality. They deny reality. The so-called primitive features that the apologists and the defenders of ape-to-man evolution had pointed to in the case of the hobbits, also known as Homo floresiensis, Homo erectus, Homo naledi, Homo neanderthalensis, do not actually show they were less than human. They were not pre-human. They were all fully human. As a matter of fact, they were all made in the image of God. They did not evolve from pre-human creatures. More correctly, they were human communities, 100% human, that were persistently inbred and were in genetic decline. Exactly what would be expected from a post-Babel model. As we can see in the fossil record, pathology and genetic degeneration appears to be a common theme. This is the rule, it's not an exception. Experts in human evolution would have us believe that Homo erectus evolved into modern humans, when in fact the evidence appears to indicate that modern humans, ultimately of course descending from Adam and Eve, the first couple, changed into what proponents of evolution say are pre-humans and oftentimes transitional. These people groups were 100% human and made in the image of God. As the evidence appears to suggest, these post-Babel and sometimes possibly pre-Babel people groups were eventually driven to extinction by either genetic degeneration or human conquest. Since these isolated tribes went extinct first, 
These would be what the evolutionary community proposes are the earliest ancestors. Also, based on what we understand about the Babel event, it is apparent that the various ape types, including the Australopithecines, would have spread out before humans. Therefore, what we see in the bone beds reflects the different migration patterns of both the ape types and humans. When proponents of human evolution assert that ape-like creatures such as Lucy evolved first, what they misunderstand is that they spread out first. This is what the evidence suggests, and this is not a forward progression of ape-like creatures evolving into humans. This is simply all a reflection of post-flood and post-Babel history, perfectly consistent and expected based on the biblical model of ancestry. Another thing to consider is that we are not beholding the arrival of culture from ape-like or animal-like ancestors. We are observing a rekindling of culture by people who essentially lost everything once that confusion at Babel happened. When we think about the Tower of Babel and the groups of people living there and working together to produce it, we can think of it like our own community that we live in. We all have our own jobs. We have got people that work in the hospital, people who work in construction, people who make and distribute food. We have got farmers, police officers, we've got accountants and numerous types of doctors. As a matter of fact, this list could go on forever. No one person does it all. These jobs are broken up amongst the people to live a functioning and operating community. Now we can imagine what stemmed from the confusion of the languages at the Tower of Babel scene. Maybe one group had no real practical skills at building or hunting or even farming. This means that these groups of people deficient in these types of skills would end up living a very primitive life. Some would even look at it as prehistoric. This is exactly what we are seeing in the fossil record. The case is closed. The evidence best fits the biblical model of ancestry. The very same evidence that the evolutionary community and the proponents of ape to man evolution look to as evidence is actually evidence for independent origins. If you like this type of content, be sure to hit subscribe and also smash that like button. It actually does help. And I hope you all enjoyed this video. Goodbye, everybody. SFT is out.